Good afternoon, everyone. 1230, according to my watch, so let us begin. We're going to jump in back into Numbers 16, but first, I want to let you know I'm giving way in advance warning. In May, the end of May, beginning of June of 2018, so next year, right now I'm working on putting together a trip to the Holy Land. I uh, want to take a group of people over to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, and go to the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference at Bethlehem Bible College, the only evangelical seminary in the West Bank, and spend a few days there with uh, people from all over the world in Bethlehem, and then spend a few days after the conference seeing some of the Holy Land sites, some of where Jesus grew up. So maybe seeing some of Galilee, uh, Bethlehem, down near the Dead Sea area, Jerusalem, that kind of stuff. I'm working on the logistics right now in partnership with my friends at Bethlehem Bible College. So I've been talking to the dean and the president over there. And we're in the works right now of putting it together. But the goal will be to make the trip um, not just a tourist trip, but an educational trip. And not just a Bible educational trip, but an also today educational trip, like the people that live there, the, seeing the land through the eyes of the people that actually live in the Middle East, but also seeing the places where Jesus walked and talked and where God stepped into human history, and uh, the Old Testament sites as well. Ideally, I'd like to fly into Jordan and see some of the stuff on the east bank of the Jordan River, the, the areas that are there actually we're going to be reading about in Numbers, and then make our way into uh, the Bethlehem area and all around and then uh, head back out. So that's the goal. And, and like I said, I'm putting it together right now. I want to be able to offer a, a package for people that want to go that's super affordable. Uh, we won't be doing any luxury tour line, bus liners or <laughs> any you know, five-star hotel stuff, but it'll be very much a time of going and just having your eyes open to the biblical and to the modern realities of that land in a place that's doing some incredible work in the Middle East. Probably the most, imp I think the most important ministry in the Middle East right now is Bethlehem Bible College. What they're doing, how they're equipping and training and, and getting to tour with them and their uh, people would just be amazing. So I was there in 2014, it was fantastic. I've been dying to get back ever since. And uh, I would love to, that'll be, an out, uh, that'll be a trip that I want my ministry, Disciple Dojo, to offer people. So I wanted you guys to be among the first to hear about it. If you follow me on Facebook, you were the first to hear about it. You guys are the second to hear about it. Uh, but I'll, I'll have more information as it comes along. It's just in the planning stages now. But again, I, I, I would love to take whoever wants to go. And even if you don't want to go, I'd love to have people that, that would say, I, I want to see this happen. How, how can I support your ministry uh, and, and to work to make it a good trip? Because I'd like to be able to, for Disciple Dojo, the ministry to subsidize some of the expenses uh, so that people can go. Um, so anyway, keep that in mind. Keep it in prayer. Pray for open doors. I've been wanting to get back there for years, and it seems like God's opening some doorways for it. So please keep that lifted up in prayer. <clears throat> Numbers. We're in the book of Numbers. We're in the section that you have to read all as one. Everything from about chapter 13, actually from about chapter 11, uh, through chapter 19 is, is one unit. And we were in the cycle of rebellion where the rabble, the outer folk, uh, the people on the outskirts rebelled. Then Moses, uh, Arian, Aaron and Miriam rebelled. And each time God sets them straight, then um, the spies rebelled, the people as a whole rebelled, and they lost their salvation. I mean, I, I put it that way because that's literally what happened. They lost, they forfeited actually, they didn't lose it. They forfeited their salvation. What God had saved them for, which was life in the promised land, they chose high-handedly to rebel, and God said, fine, you're not going to get it. And so everything that they had been saved for was all for naught in this generation. They were going to die in the desert with their corpses littering the sands. 
And that was God's punishment that he told him. But God's faithful to his promises. And God's promises, we can, ex- we can forfeit ourselves from receiving the benefits of those promises. But his promises to his people as a whole will go forward. And the generation that rebelled is the generation that was punished. The next generation is the one who will receive the blessing. So God's promises are never rendered null and void by the forfeiture of those promises on the part of individuals within the community. And that's an important dynamic in both the Old Testament and the New Testament because it helps explain things like how can God predestine his people for glory, but then we turn away from him and and commit apostasy uh, if we choose to. And, and, And instead of rejecting one of those, we can hold them both and say, well, this is how. Because his promises are corporate. And if we are in his people, then we are going to partake of those promises. If we remove ourselves from his covenant people, we remove ourselves from those promises. And so the, the, the promise in the New Testament is true. Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. Nothing snatched the Israelites out of God's hand. They chose to leave. They chose to high-handedly rebel against him. And that's the one thing that Paul never mentions in terms of things that can separate us from the love of God. The one thing that he never mentions is our own rebellion. And we see that in Israel that is in fact what separated them from the promises and the relationship that God had intended to have for them to have. So then after that though, God gives this chapter 15, which seems random to some interpreters, but as we talked about last week, I think those interpreters are wrong. I think it's not random. I think it's very much woven into the literary fabric of what's going on in this whole section overall. God restores and reiterates the covenant with his people. He reiterates the promises of uh, the sacrificial system continuing and his forgiveness and his mercy, but also his justice. And he holds those two things forward. And then he gives them, uh, and then there's an example of high handed sin that's quickly condemned by God and punished. And then he gives them a reminder hey, you're all to be holy, you're all to be a kingdom of priests. So I want you to wear these things on your garments, these tzitzit, these tassels, these blue tassels, cords. You're going to wear them and they're going to remind you that you are a sanctified, holy people. Now the problem is, again, lack of balance. You always want to approach Scripture with balance. And if you you take one scriptural truth and elevate it at the expense of others, you get out of balance and your theology gets out of whack and that leads to ethics that can get out of whack. That leads to a cascade effect in your life. Theology matters. What you think about God matters. It, it matters what you believe about God. It matters what you believe about um, theological things. The biggest lie in the church history ever is that theology doesn't matter, just give me Jesus. No, theology is knowledge of God. That's what it means. And so a relationship with Jesus is theology. Your walk with the Lord is theology. Um, And bad theology can have bad consequences in life. And we see that in this chapter because the people take a a kernel of truth that God promised or gave in that previous chapter, in chapter 15, that idea of you're holy, you're all holy, you're all to be a kingdom of priests. They take that kernel of truth and twist it for their own advantage, which is what so many false teachers do. False teachers never come out and say, I'm a false teacher, follow me. Right? Nobody ever starts a cult by saying, hey, I'm a cult. Come join my cult. They don't do that. What they do is they convince you, hey, I've got biblical knowledge that none of these other teachers and preachers have ever had. I've, I've discovered something new in Scripture. Let me show you what I've found when I was praying and the Lord showed me. Just be careful when you hear that. It doesn't mean that God didn't. God can speak. He does speak. He can show us things in Scripture. But if it's something that nobody else has seen, if it's something He hadn't shown anybody else, that's kind of a red flag. Uh, and, and so in this section, <clears throat> chapter 16 now, it says, Korah, son of Izhar, son of Koath, son of Levi, so a Levite, this is Korah, the Levite, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? So here's the scene, Moses, Aaron just given this uh, reaffirmation of the covenant in the last chapter with these laws and stipulations, 
and, and the, the last one, you know, wear these tassels so that you'll all be holy and you'll remember that you're a holy nation. Now these, these three people, actually four, so Korah, who's a Levite, he's, he's a Kohathite. He's, the Kohathites, remember, they're the ones who were in charge of carrying the implements of the tabernacle. Like they were the ones who literally carried the lampstand and the sacrificial altar and the incense altar and all that kind of stuff. So they're as close to the high priest as you can get. So Korah is one of them. Then these other Reubenites. So Reuben was the firstborn of Israel. So the Reubenites were, were uh, camped right by the Kohathites on the southern side of the tabernacle. So these Reubenites, uh, Nadab, uh, uh, Dathan, and Abiram, excuse me, and then one other guy named On, but On's never really mentioned again. So we don't know how much he was in cahoots with them. But these four people come, and with them, 250 community leaders. Men of well-known name. These are, these are not just the rabble. These are not the riffraff. These are leaders of the community in Israel. Le- now, we don't know if that's leaders of the tribe of Reuben or if they're leaders for all the tribes. It doesn't say, but these are 250. So this is not just a few people now coming with their complaints. This is like the cream of the crop in terms of leadership in Israel. And they oppose Moses and they say that you have gone too far. In Hebrew... It's literally too much for you. It's, it's, that's literally what they're saying. There's, you've taken too much. You have claimed too much for yourself. And then they say, the whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. That's the true statement. That's the truth. All right? The lie always comes as twisted form of the truth. That's the true part. Then the next part is the lie. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? That's the lie. Moses and Aaron never set themselves anywhere. Moses did not want this job, if you remember back in Exodus. God appointed them. God has appointed and has confirmed their leadership over and over and over again. So now these leaders, these men of renown, these men who are used to calling the shots and getting their own way in some degree, not, no longer satisfied with being middle management. All right, they want the CEO position. They want the big office. And so they come to Moses with their complaint. When Moses heard this, he fell face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, in the morning the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy, and he will have that person come near him. The man he chooses will come near to him. You, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers and tomorrow put fire and incense in them before the Lord. That's what the, the workers and the priests did. Priests offered incense and fire before the Lord. Remember Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, who were uh, destroyed because of their fire that they offered before the Lord was done according to their prerogative rather than as God's command. God takes it very seriously. The ones who can present fire and incense before the altar are the legitimate priests. And right now, the only people that can do that are Aaron and his other sons. And so what Moses is saying is, okay, you want this, you, you, this is what you want? Fine. Get ready. You want to be priest? Tomorrow you get your chance. So he tells them, the man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. You Levites have gone too far. Now up until now, the Levites have not been in any of the other rebellions. The previous rebellions of this generation have been done by the other tribes. And the questions remained is, well, what about the Levites? Are they, are they still on the Lord's side? I mean, that's why they were chosen to be the, the priesthood anyway, is because they were the ones who stood for the Lord, even against their own people. So God appointed them as guards around His holiness uh, in the tabernacle to keep Israelites from doing exactly what Korah and these are trying to do, which is to break into or to set themselves up as God's leaders to approach God through unauthorized means. So the question is, so what about the Levites of this generation? Are they, are they still fully devoted to the Lord? And we see now these, this is an example of these men that are with Korah, who is a Levite. They are not. Even the Levites, the, play, the, the, the rebellion has crept all the way into even the Levites who were charged with guarding God's holiness. This generation has just been a downward spiral for the last few chapters. So, <clears throat> Moses also said to Korah, listen, you Levites, isn't it enough for you that God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near to Himself to do the work of the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community and minister to them? He's brought you and all your fellow Levites near Himself, but now you are trying to get the priesthood too? 
It is against the Lord that you and your followers have banded together. Who is Aaron that you should grumble against him? So he's letting the Levites know, hey, God called you for this purpose. You were called to have a special place in this thing that we know of as the tabernacle. Your role is vital. But you're not satisfied with that. You see it as a hierarchy of value and importance and stature. And you want to all be priests as well. Even though God said, no, only from the line of Aaron will I call the priests. So, um, he speaks to them first and he's reminding them tabernacle service is not a right. It's a gift from God. Ministry is not a right. Nobody has a right to be a minister. Nobody has a right to teach or preach. It's what God gives. God is the one who chooses and gives and appoints people. And if those, those persons are self-appointed, you can usually tell when, uh, versus when people are called by God and it's confirmed by God's people and you see the gifts and the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work. You can, you can tell, so be aware of that. <clears throat> so then Moses, so he's talked to the Levites, Korah's crew. Then Moses summoned the other faction, because remember there's Levites, Korah and his Levites, and then there are the Reubenites. And their, uh, their complaints aren't theological. Korah's complaints are like liturgical, church complaints. The Reubenites' complaints are political or, or, or worldly complaints. So he's dealt with the first, the Levites. Hey, come tomorrow. We're going to find out who God's calls to be a priest and not. And now he's going to deal with the other faction of the rebellion. There were two people, or there were two groups that were rebelling, and they had very different purposes. Korah and his group, and uh, Dathan and Obiram and their group. One was rebelling because of uh, church spiritual things. One was rebelling, because, as we're going to see, because of earthly things. They banded together. They came as a united front to attack the ministry Uh, the leadership of Moses, which is really crafty. So Moses deals individually with them. He's dealt with one now. Moses summoned Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab. So he called them out. But they said, we're not going to come. Isn't it enough that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert? Now you also want to lord it over us? Moreover, you haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you gouge out the eyes of these men? No, we will not come. So, there's a couple of things here contextually to note. First, that phrase, will you gouge out the eyes of these men? What does that have to do with anything? Who said anything about gouging out eyes? This is again where it helps to know the language of Scripture as the original Hebrew language, not modern English. This is an idiom. This is a figure of speech. Will you gouge out the eyes of these men is, is the equivalent in Hebrew of saying, are you trying to pull the wool over our eyes? Are you trying to hoodwink us? That's the phrase. That's the figure of speech. That's what it means to gouge the eyes out. It means you're trying to pull a fast one. Like That's how we say it in English. In Hebrew, they'd say gouge the eyes out. So it's a figure of speech. Moses wasn't jamming things in anybody's eyeballs. Um, so they're like, no, you're trying to trick us. We're not even going to come out and talk to you. You don't summon us. We're not under your authority. You said, and this is the this is this really insidious part, isn't it enough that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? That is the height of evil. Because they were brought up out of a land of slavery. They were brought up out of Egypt to go into a land flowing with milk and honey. That was the promise God gave them about Canaan. God described Canaan as a land flowing with milk and honey. The spies went in, and even the spies that rejected the land because they were scared in the previous chapter said, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is a land that's good. So now these folks are taking that description of the promise of God and applying it to the slavery in Egypt. They're looking back to quote the good old days. Newsflash, there were no good old days. That holds true today as well. When people long for good old days, there were no good old days. Every day has had its evils. Every day has had its good. And it's something to keep in mind whenever people start raising this, oh, it used to be so great. I remember, well, of course you remember. You only remember the good things. You don't remember the evil. You don't remember baking bricks in the Egyptian sun. You don't remember the whips of the taskmaster on your back. You don't remember the Pharaoh taking your baby boys and drowning them in the river. Those things get conveniently left out. And they just emphasize the goodness that they had. And so they said that. We're not going to go up. You you took us out of a land flowing with milk and honey, and you're going to make us die in the desert now. So again, they're attributing what God had done God brought them up out of slavery. God had condemned them now to die in the desert for their rebellion. 
they're attributing that to Moses. They're saying it's your fault, Moses. You're the one who did this. And so, uh, <clears throat> verse 15, then Moses became very angry. This is, I think, one of two times in the entire Torah where it says Moses became very angry. There's angry, and then there's angry ma'od, exceedingly angry. I think the first one was at the Golden Calf incident. This, this, I believe, is the second one, but it's rare when Moses gets very angry. So Moses became very angry, and he said to the Lord, he didn't take his, he, he speaks to God first. In his anger, he prays. Moses said to the Lord, don't accept their offering. I've not taken so much as a donkey from them, nor have I wronged any of them. In other words, he pleads his case before God, and he actually does the opposite of what Moses always does. Moses always intercedes for his people. This is the instance where he actually anti-intercedes for these. They have passed the point of no return. And so Moses specifically says, God, don't, take their, don't accept their offering. Don't, he takes his cry of vengeance to the Lord, not out against them. It's, very, it's just fascinating, but this is what does it. Because it, it was such a lie. Everything that they said in that, chap, in, that, in that response to him was not just insolent, but it was a lie. It wasn't a twisting of the truth at all. It was a bold-faced lie. Taking the truth and completely disfiguring it and then presenting it. So there, there's a time for righteous anger, and this is an example of it. And so Moses makes a little imprecatory prayer. Which is, that's what the, the, you know those psalms that say, Lord, may their heads of their infants be dashed against the rocks. May they be killed without mercy. May you wipe out, blah, blah, blah. Those are called imprecatory psalms. That's when you're asking God to do harm to someone. And people wrestle with those. Why are they in the Bible? How does this fit with what we know about Jesus and love your enemies and this and that? The purpose of imprecatory psalms and imprecation in Scripture is that they're taking that to God. It's not Moses who's enacting this vengeance. It's not the psalmist who's actually going out and, and killing or butchering or seeking revenge for wrongs. They're taking all of those real emotions, those real gripes, those real desires for vengeance, and they're taking it to God in prayer. That's the value of imprecatory psalms because imprecatory psalms are honest. If you've had someone close to you or you yourself have, have been the, the recipient of just hateful, venomous talk, or maneuvering or manipulations or actions that try to literally destroy you, then there's something very understandable about feeling that anger and that sense of betrayal and a desire for vengeance. To deny it and say, oh, I'll just love them anyway. Sometimes that's, you, you can't get there yet before you go through the depths of that really being honest with your feelings before God. And just saying, Lord, I know I'm supposed to love this person, but I hate them right now. There's something very real and authentic about that that shouldn't be glossed over in our rush to get to love your enemies. Because then what we end up doing is we kind of push all the hatred or all the bitter feelings. Instead of letting them out, we push them down and we let them fester. And those of you that know anything about counseling, you know when relationships are built on avoidance of issues and avoidance of negativity instead of letting it out in a healthy way when it's just pushed down and ignored then it rots it festers it it, it, it erodes from the inside and so this the psalms of imprecation and the moses prayer here these things are in scripture i think as a reminder to us that we do need to allow ourselves those times to do that to express that raw uh, emotion and feelings of of just anger and vengeance to god but express them to god and then let him be the one who acts on our behalf. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. I will repay. And that's exactly what we see in this chapter. Moses said to Cor so Moses, he's dealt with these two, these the, the Reubenites, the political uh, usurpers. He's he's not even didn't even respond to them. They said their piece, and Moses just looks at God and says, "Don't they're done? Don't listen. Don't don't take their sacrifices. They're done." basically. Now he turns back to Korah, back to the religiously motivated ones who, who he's talked to before, and basically reiterates, okay, remember, this is what's going to happen. Moses said to Korah, you and all your followers are to appear before the Lord tomorrow, you and they and Aaron. So in other words, this is going to be something we all do this together. Each man is to take his censer and put incense in it, 250 censers in all, and present it before the Lord. 
you and Aaron are to present your censers also. So each man took his censer, put fire and incense in it, and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They put fire and incense in their pans, their incense censers. The only fire that you're supposed to put in and offer is fire from the altar. To put in fire, put in your own incense, to do it your own way, that's what Aaron's two sons did back in Leviticus 10. And they were destroyed by fire from the Lord. Once again now, we have 250 people offering such strange fire, uh, unauthorized fire before the Lord. When Korah had gathered all his followers in opposition to them at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord appeared to the entire assembly. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. So God shows up. you got the factions, Moses and Aaron, all the assembly are gathered, and all the assembly are kind of being swayed to the side of the rebellion. All right. Then you have Moses and Aaron, and God says, you guys, back up. I'm about to wipe them all out. It's the second time he's offered to do this. He offered to do it once at the golden calf, <clears throat> and Moses interceded. Now he's offering it again. But Moses and Aaron fell face down and cried out, Oh God, God of the spirits of all mankind. Or that could literally read, God of the breath of all humanity. It's the same words. Will you be angry with the entire assembly when only one man sins? This echoes what Abraham said way back in Genesis 18 when he was pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he knew there was at least one or two righteous people. like, God, are you going to wipe out the whole city when only a few of them are guilty? And just like back then, God said, no, no, I won't wipe out the innocent with the wicked. That's not the type of God I am. So again, Moses intercedes. He says, wait a minute, you don't have to wipe out everybody. Yes, the crowd's swayed, but they're being swayed by these people. These are the ones that are guilty. You're not a God who punishes indiscriminately. He, he, quote, reminds God of this. This is a beautiful interaction between Moses and God because Moses is God's, God's allowing himself once again, like he did with Abraham, to be talked down, to, to allow his mercy to put, be on the front, but without sacrificing his justice. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to the assembly, Move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So God listens to Moses. God allows himself to be persuaded by Moses' intercession and Aaron's intercession. It says, okay, tell everybody who's not with him to get away. Make it clear who's on the side against me and who's on the side for me. So, uh, verse 25, Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. He warned the assembly, move back from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything belonging to them or you'll be swept away because of their sins. So they moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram had come out and were standing with their wives, children, and little ones at the entrances to their tent. So they ever came to Moses. Finally now they walk out and they just like, you get this sense of defiant. They're high-handedly standing in their tents. No, we're staying here. Our family is staying here. We're against you, and we're not moving. All the other assembly and the elders had moved away, had listened to, had the glory of the Lord, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire is right there. You don't get more high-handed than this. You don't get more rebellious than this. This isn't a case of, ooh, I accidentally sinned, and now God's sending me to hell. No, no, no. This is outright rebellion. Then Moses says, this is how you will know that the Lord sent me to do all these things, and that it was not my idea. Literally, it says, it was not from my heart. The, the concept of heart meaning your, your inner will, your desire, your idea. This wasn't from my heart. If these men die a natural death and experience only what usually happens to men, meaning normal death, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about something totally new and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. You will know that they rejected the anointed leader of the Lord. And to reject the Lord's anointed is to reject the Lord. This is why David later was so hesitant about killing Saul even after God had promised him the throne because Saul was still the anointed leader of God and David knew, no, I don't raise a hand against him. 
There's something very powerful about this, this authority that God has instilled in His anointed. And ultimately, it would be fulfilled in the anointed one Himself. Capital A, anointed one. Messiah. Jesus. So, <clears throat> Moses has basically said, hey, if nothing happens and these guys live a normal life and die a normal death, then that's how you'll know God hasn't sent me. But if something completely new happens, and the verb that's used, if God... Uh, brings about something totally new. That's a verb in Hebrew that's the word for create back in Genesis. Only God ever creates. And this is if God creates something completely new and the earth swallows them up, then you'll know that God has sent me. Their, their complaint, previous chapters, if you remember, was we can't go into Canaan. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. And so now in, a, in another irony, that land, or the land that devours its inhabitants, Canaan, is fine. And its children are gonna, God's children are going to reach it. The land that they chose to rebel in is actually going to be the land that swallows its rebellious inhabitants in this. There's so much irony. There's so many uh, uh, phrases and words and language used in this section that we miss if we just skim through it. But it's like God is, in this judgment, is going to temporarily, for a brief moment, undo creation. And there's going to be that, that, that abyss, that chaos, that darkness is going to creep back in and is going to claim those who rebel. Those who set themselves against God's purposes are inviting that decreation. They're inviting that chaos. They're inviting that darkness to take over what God has done. Because Israel was God's new creation. The language of creation is used all throughout the language of Israel that we've read in the past three years as we've gone through this journey. And so now we're going to see what happens to those who stand against the God of all creation. We saw what happened when Pharaoh did it. Now we're going to see what happens even when leaders in Israel do it. But we're going to see that next week because we're out of time. So there's your cliffhanger ending. Come back next week and we'll see you then. Bye.